and uh, this talk is on uh, you know csp which i uh, you know uh, i look at it as a browser side firewall right uh, before before i begin i would uh, you know quickly like to understand if any of you are uh, you know currently or ever in the past or you know in the future uh, looking to be interested with any security related uh, responsibilities like a show of hands wow okay that's good that's a, that's a good number 30% and i presume the ones who have uh, not been interested with now probably in the future you know down the line you would eventually be uh, pushed into it or at least some responsibility you'll have to take up or let me ask another question uh, have have any of you uh, faced any attacks on your servers or anything of that kind not you personally but your company servers have been attacked you know you, you've seen some raise of hands okay good only the people at the back are raising so that, because their faces are not visible the ones here are being very discreet you know it's like yeah i got attacked but i'm not uh, telling anybody about it okay so the, uh, let, let me you know i'll not waste a lot of time i'll get started directly <clears throat> a little bit about myself i'm the founder of ironwasp security uh, we build a product called as uh, sboxer so this is a continuous security monitoring system and uh, one of the techniques it uses for uh, security monitoring is using uh, csp content security policy right so some of the techniques we developed for this system i'll be explaining that here in the talk and uh, you know i've been doing uh, security products uh, developing security products for about 10 years now and my expertise is uh, web application security right. okay so this is the outline of the uh, of the talk we will first talk about data exfiltration attacks what they are uh, and then we'll look at how they can be detected using content security policy and then we'll see how uh, so once I explain, you know, how the system will work, then we'll talk about how that system can be implemented, right? So some of the implementation details. And then finally, we'll talk about some of the limitations in that approach and uh, what you could potentially do to overcome those limitations, right? So that's roughly how the talk is going to be structured. If you have any questions uh, in any part, you can, you know, raise your hand and we can get it addressed, uh, you know, then and there. Okay, so let's talk about data ex exfiltration first. Uh, so here we have three companies, you know, all uh, big names, Ticketmaster, British Airways, Newegg, uh, you know, these are uh, big companies with millions of uh, customers and all three companies uh, were attacked in 2018 and uh, these are the number of credit card details which were stolen, you know, uh, so these are, these are big numbers and in fact with Newegg.com, the attackers were able to steal uh, about 45 million uh, credit card information, right? Now, the impact of the attack is, is serious, but what is even more serious is the duration for which the attack actually took place, you know. So, uh, it's one thing to get attacked, uh, which is, you, you can have a single, you know, like she was saying, you can have one weak link in any of your systems and that can be used, uh, you know, by an attacker to attack you, right. So, that is very difficult to, you know, actually uh, protect against, you know, not, not be attacked at all. But once an attack actually takes place, you should at least know that your systems are being attacked, right? And you should be able to, once you know you're being attacked, then you can actually do something to stop the attack from happening, right? But the, the, the scary thing here is the attacks, they were high impact attacks, obviously, because a lot of credit card information was stolen, but they went on for a very long time, you know, before they were actually picked up. Uh, in case of Ticketmaster, it went on for more than eight months. And I usually say that if, someone got to know they were pregnant when the attack started, then, you know, they would have actually had the baby, you know, before they found the attack was going on and they actually stopped it. So, that's how long the attack went undetected. Now, this is a very, very serious thing. You cannot have your systems being attacked and you not even knowing about it, right? So, uh, I'll, I'll try and, uh, uh, you know, so that's why this talk was made because this is a, this is a kind of attack which is not having a lot of understanding with people. So I'll, I'll explain how this can be used, uh, it, this can be detected using CSP. Okay, now why did it not get detected for so long? Now data exfiltration is usually monitored on the server side. Now data exfiltration, uh, let me, let me uh, explain it for the ones who do not understand. It is, you know, data being extracted out of your environment, right? So you own an asset and if any, uh, if somebody else is able to extract data out of it, that's called as a data exfiltration attack. Uh, we monitored data being stolen from the server side but uh, any data theft on the client side is never uh, monitored, you know. So, let's, let's say this is a very overly simplistic uh, representation of your environment. 
Now, if you have your server here and it is being monitored. Now, I have said monitored by IDS which is an intrusion detection system, but you can have different uh, you know systems which are actually monitoring this. And if your server starts sending data to somebody you know some to some external party, then some server level monitoring system will pick it up. Even if it is not necessarily a security based monitoring system, even your APM might pick it up you know and it, you might know that hey my system is sending data to this external party. But let us say your client side which is your browser, you load a whole bunch of JavaScript on the client side and if you are uh, you know you go to hasgeek.com and let us say JavaScript in hasgeek.com starts sending data to the uh, starts sending data to an external domain, then uh, you do not really have any uh, mechanism to detect that right. So, this is how uh, all of this data was actually stolen. I will go into details of how exactly the attack took place a little later. So, here you can see egress traffic is not being monitored. So, the attack can go on undetected for uh, extensive periods of time. Now, how does this happen? An attacker will uh, look for any weakness in your application right. So, there are different ways in which uh, different kinds of weaknesses you can have, but once he finds some way by which he can in inject his own uh, malicious code into your site, he will do that. And once he has done that, he will just wait for your users to visit your site. And as your users visit, visit your site and they feed in their details, then the attacker's JavaScript can actually still, still you know like collect this information and send it to their servers right. So, technically it is a very straightforward uh, you know attack uh, uh, to, to, to perform. Now, there are different ways in which an attacker can inject uh, malicious code into your uh, website. I, I do not have to go into details here. You have something called cross site scripting, it is a it is a it is a form of a, you know uh, uh, it is a vulnerability you have on your application which can be exploited. If you are using external CDNs which most people do, if the CDNs get compromised then the JavaScript there can be modified. Uh, if you are uh, using advertising or analytics uh, you know code loaded from external parties and if they get they do not necessarily have to get compromised uh, in the sense they do not have to get uh, hacked by the attacker, but even if they are gamed by an attacker then you know uh, you, your site can get affected. And finally, if your web server itself is compromised by an attacker then even then uh, you know he can inject uh, you can modify the contents of your JavaScript. Now, this uh, is an example of uh, British Airways. I do not know how clearly you can see the uh, you know the text on the slide, but this is the you know uh, the JavaScript uh, which was actually attacked. So, this is modernizer hyphen 2.6.2.min.js ok. So, this is a specific version of modernizer JavaScript file which was being loaded by uh, British Airways. So, what the attackers did was they uh, modified the uh, you know content of the JavaScript file because they were able to get a you know get enough access to modify the you know uh, JavaScript files on the server. So, they took an existing JavaScript file which was being loaded by British Airways website they just added a bunch of JavaScript to the end of this file. You know, they did not change the functionality, they just included their JavaScript at the end. And any British Airways page which was loading this, which was most uh, pages, uh, had the attacker's JavaScript file, uh, JavaScript running. So, when the attacker from the user enters their credit card information, this JavaScript will take it and it will send it to their server. Okay, so once an attacker is able to inject the JavaScript file, how can they uh, take you know data and send it to their external sources? So, they can use different ways. The reason I cover this is uh, only if we know how the data is taken out, we can talk about how they can be you know uh, stopped using uh, content security policy. So, the first approach is they can try to load resources from an external site. Like for example, I can say uh, you know image src slash attacker dot com slash and then the you know credit card information. So, there will be a web there will be a request made to my server and my web server log will have the credit card information. Or I can force the user to navigate to an external site. I can put a link. He clicks on the link. Now the request is made to my uh, website. Uh, or they can use DOM APIs like AJAX, uh, Fetch, and so on to actually send data to my uh, server. That is the attacker server. So this is the uh, uh, you know additional piece of JavaScript which was injected into British Airways website. So this is the actual code. It was not like this uh, you know beautifully uh, formatted they had like, of course minified it and everything but once you uh, expand it this, this is roughly how it looks and it's it's surprisingly elegant code you know they have <laughs> not done much so what they are doing is they're like listening for uh, you know the uh, submit button uh, they have attached uh, you know bunch of event uh, handlers to it and uh, whenever someone is feeding data into it they take the payment form and then they serialize it 
and then they put it into an ajax uh, call and they send it to this domain called baways.com now baways.com you would think actually is you know it belongs to british airways but this was a domain registered by the attackers right so ba.com is actual british airways domain so they went and they registered baways.com and you know so that if someone looks at it, it, it they think it's you know legitimate uh, traffic so this this little piece of code is what led to uh, 40000 credit card information you know of british airways customers being stolen and uh, british airways i think is looking at a fine of about uh, uh, 100 million plus dollars uh, under gdpr you know because of this particular attack so this is serious stuff now uh, this is how you can uh, steal data you know using external uh, urls and so on i just talked about it briefly uh, you know you put the attack uh, stolen data here and you load a new script or you can you know send it using the uh, you know communication apis okay so now i think that gives you a rough idea about uh, what a data exfiltration attack is when it takes place on the client side how an, how an attacker could uh, perform it you know how they could actually steal data so i think that much is established yes Mm -hmm. uh, that we are not sure because uh, British Airways has not uh, given away that information. You know how an attacker, how the attackers were able to actually change the contents of the file. That uh, we do not know, right? But irrespective of how it was done, uh, what we are interested is in the end result, right? Like once the file gets changed, it did not get detected, right? So that's what uh, we're going to focus on. So I, I, I doubt British Airways would give that information away because it should be very confidential for them, right? Okay, so in terms of detection, there are two ways in which you can do this detection. One is you can detect it at the JavaScript level. I'll talk about it briefly. So uh, you have your application code, which is written by your developers, which is here, and then your native APIs. The native APIs are all the DOM APIs exposed by your browser. The application code will communicate with the DOM APIs on a regular basis to you know like uh, read data from the local storage or to send information on the network and so on. So what you can do is you can actually put an abstraction layer in between and you do this by hooking into the native APIs. So let's say for example you, you hook into the fetch API uh, you know uh, fetch API. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uh, client side APIs but you know it's an API to perform network communication. So once you hook into it so what happens is Whenever the application developer is writing code to call this API, then the call will not go to the go to that API directly, but it will instead come to your code, right? Which is your hooked uh, piece of code. And now here you can actually look at uh, to which URL the data is being sent and so on. So you can do some level of uh, monitoring on it, and then you can call the native API, right? So this way you sit in between, uh, or you can you can uh, in in some ways you can monitor the functioning of your uh, JavaScript code, right? This is one approach, but it has a few disadvantages. One is it's it's complicated because you will have to do this hooking of native APIs, and uh, if you uh, and it's not a trivial thing to do. And if you make any mistakes, then it will break your application's functionality. You know, and if it's breaking application fun functionality consistently, then the you know the managers would essentially say, you know what, you know, let's do away with it because it's essentially affecting your productivity, right? You're paying a price for that uh, additional security. So and it, it, it's going to take coding and maintenance effort. So that's money. And uh, it'll also have performance impact, right? Because it's it's changing the speed at which your JavaScript code is running. Because every time there's a native call, there's another piece of code which runs and it performs some actions and all that. And if you get some intern to write that code, it's you know because like you don't want to spare your star programmer who's working on an important feature. So Uh, yeah, that's that's a good point. Uh, the thing is, it depends on when you load it. So essentially, you would load this hooking code at the, as the very first thing which loads into your application, right? So, and if you're say using something like Cloudflare, you can just configure it at Cloudflare and it'll load it at the very beginning, right? So this will run even before the attacker's code uh, comes in, right? But if you had access to modify the source, mm -hmm. files, files just load oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean. <laughs> Yes, so for example, so that's the worst case scenario where an attacker is able to come into your, your server, has 
unrestricted access to any, modify any JavaScript. If they could do that, then of course they can change this code as well. That's maybe I should add that as another disadvantage. That's a good point. But uh, assuming the person doesn't have unrestricted access, they can only you know modify some sections. So this will still uh, hold good, right? But uh, but that's another uh, you know uh, weakness you have with the system as well. Okay, so uh, those are some downsides with the JavaScript approach. Now we'll talk about uh, the uh, you know the primary approach we're going to discuss here, which is the content security policy approach. Uh, how many of you have heard about content security policy or know what it is? Mm, not that many. Okay. Uh, content security policy has a few advantages. One is uh, it can be done either by the developers or it can be done by the network or infrastructure team, right? So it is not strictly a coding effort. Uh, and it's a much simpler approach because you're not modifying any existing behavior, you're using a built in uh, functionality in the browser. And if you configure it in the monitoring mode, then it will not break your uh, website's functionality at all. You know, so it's, it, you can you can uh, do it with uh, you know peace of mind, and it has no performance impact also. Right. So these are the advantages with uh, this approach. And uh, content security policy itself, it's a uh, functionality supported by your browser. It's available in all uh, you know supported in all modern browsers, and you can think of it like a firewall for your browser. Right. Now I'm sure all of you know what a firewall is. And uh, you would never put a website on the internet or any uh, service on the internet without it being protected by a firewall, right? So uh, when you have an equivalent for your browser, you should also you know, make sure that you always turn it on so that you control what your browser can do. And now what a content security policy does is it essentially tells your browser what it should and should not do, right? So one is typically a browser, whatever the server sends as a content. It will follow the you know content. It will first run the you know, HTML parser and JavaScript parser and so on. And whatever code is there, it will essentially evaluate all of that, right? But content security policy is like it, it, it's it's a it's an instruction you give to the browser saying, hey, this is how I expect my site to behave. So irrespective of what code is downloaded from the site, it the browser will always refer to this policy. And if the code is you know uh, trying to do something which the policy has not allowed, then the browser will not uh, perform that particular action. Right? So that's in essence what uh, content security policy is. And it has two modes. One is you can put it in a blocking mode. So which means if there is a uh, you know uh, behavior the code wants to do, which the policy is not allowing, then the browser will stop that from happening. Now that's a blocking mode. And then you have a monitoring mode where if the uh, code wants to do something which the policy does not allow then it will let the thing to happen, but it will give you an alert saying, hey, your policy said this should not happen, but the code is actually doing this thing, right? So that's the mode in which we are going to, uh, you know, like deploy our policy to look for these kind of attacks. Now, this is an example of what a CSP policy would look. Uh, it has, uh, uh, you know, uh, two components. You have these directives. Directives are individual, uh, okay, I'll, I'll get into the details a little later. So you have content security policy and content security policy report only. So report only is the monitoring mode uh, system. And if you just say content security policy, then it goes into blocking mode, right? And what follows that is the actual uh, policy definition itself, okay? Now, the policy definition is made up of a bunch of directives. So here, uh, these are the directives and each directive is uh, separated by a semicolon, okay? So you can think of a directive as a specific command, which defines one specific behavior of your application. Okay, so uh, and these uh, directives cover different kinds of behavior. As in, like for example, there's a directive which says uh, what kind of CSP behavior should be there on your site. There's another directive which says what kind of image loading behavior should be present. There's another directive which says what kind of communication-based behavior is allowed. Right? So each directive is meant for a different uh, behavior. Now, for the purpose of this uh, specific, uh, you know, uh, attack detection, the directives which are of interest. Now, there are there are a lot of directives which are supported by CSP, you know. But for this specific attack, the directives of interest are these: script SRC, style SRC, image SRC. You know, like I put a whole bunch of them. I've I've researched the entire list of CSP directives and. These are the only ones which are applicable to the uh, job at hand, right? So you can just uh, stick to these. And uh, each directive has a value uh, associated with that, right? 
So the value, the directive says, you know, each, di each directive controls a certain behavior. The value will, uh, you know, uh, say or it will specify, you know, how the behavior should be. So for example, the possible values are, you can have none, you can have self, or you can specify either a single domain or multiple domains, right? And the domain can be just the domain name or it can be the origin or it can be the origin and even a path included, right? So it, it can be very uh, vague or it can be very specific. And what the value does is it says, uh, uh, you know, how this particular behavior should be. For example, here you have connect SRC. Connect SRC defines your browser's communication uh, behavior, okay? So if you say connect SRC none, then your, your, your browser will not make any kind of uh, uh, you know, DOM communication calls, which is any AJAX communication which is made will be blocked by your uh, browser. If I say connect SRC none, when I say none, I mean do not connect to anybody. If I say connect SRC self, now here I have script SRC and I, the value is self. When I say self, then it means load JavaScript files, but only loaded from the same domain. So if you're visiting hasgeek.com, then it can, the browser will only load JavaScript files from hasgeek.com, not from any other external domain. Or you can specify a specific origin. So here it says style src and then this. So this means that CSS files can only be loaded from this particular origin, right? And you can mix and match. So for example, you can say script src self, comma, abc.com, comma, you know, 123.com. So which means it will load it from the same domain as well as abc.com as well as 123.com. So I think you get an idea of how uh, this thing is, it is, it is very uh, simple, it is very straightforward, nothing complicated here. Okay, so we'll quickly go through the different directives and the related browser behavior. Uh, so script SRC, if you have a script SRC like this, you say, uh, you know, uh, you say script SRC and then you give the name of the site from where you want to load the code. So then if you have a script tag like this where the src is pointing to that domain then the browser will load it but if it is pointing to another uh, domain then this will be blocked by the browser which means this javascript will not be loaded and it will not be evaluated right so similarly for the other uh, origins as well uh, this is part of my slide so you can you know uh, refer to it right so for each of them i have defined which is allowed and which is not allowed okay so now that we know what the CSP uh, you know, policy is, what are its different components, now you will have to write a policy, right? Now how do you get started with writing a policy? What directives should you use and what values should you set for these directives? So what you can actually do is, you start with uh, finding out what all content your, your site is legitimately supposed to load, right? But finding out this information is difficult because your application is typically very complicated. You know, there's a lot of JavaScript uh, being loaded from different, different places, a lot of dynamic content, and this is all controlled by your developers, right? So you might not have all the information. So what you can do is you can actually use uh, CSP itself to collect this information, which is you can write a, a, a very simple policy, which is you set everything, uh, you can start with a baseline policy, right? And then you can uh, turn it on and as your users are using your website, you start getting uh, violation reports, right? So in your uh, policy, you can specify report URI and you can give a domain. So this domain, this URL is essentially a HTTP endpoint. You know, it's a web service, uh, web service endpoint. So whenever there's a policy violation, your browser will send an alert to this particular domain. Uh, 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 that is this particular endpoint. So you can collect that. So you will know, you know, uh, what all uh, violations are taking place. So if you set a baseline policy, and this is how a violation report would, uh, this is what it would look like. It will say in which URL the violation is taking place, and it will say which content is being blocked. So in this case, example.com slash CSS slash style.css is not being loaded by the browser. And uh, the reason why it is not being loaded is because of this particular directive. So you have set a directive which says style src cdn.example.com. So you're saying CSS files should only be loaded from this domain, but your uh, site is trying to load it from example.com, which is not matching. So there was a violation. So you get a report of this kind, right? So the report has all the details that you require. So what you can do is you can start with a simple uh, baseline policy. You can set it up on your server. And as your users are using it, you'll start getting these violation reports. You can look at the violation report 
and from the violation report you can identify okay what all resources i am loading and you can start adding those things to your policy right so once you do that then you will have a policy which contains all the whitelisted uh, information and every time you have a new violation you know you analyze it and then you update the policy again so this is a continuous cycle if you would see first thing you do is from the web server you set the csp header uh, to the browser then your users are browsing the site as they browse the site you will get csp violations which will be collected by your endpoint now you violate analyze these uh, you know violations and then you update your csp policy again right so this keeps going on on a continuous basis at the beginning there would be a bit of work uh, the first time you set up a policy because you have a baseline policy which is uh, you know not customized to your site so you can say the first week you would have a lot of violations but once you have tuned up the policy like from week 2 onwards you should not get any get any violations right if you get a violation it most likely is uh, you know pointing to something bad happening on your website so now what happen is once you have this policy stabilized so now you have clearly defined who your website can uh, communicate with from where it can load resources so where it can navigate and all of that information so now let's say the same attack takes place which is someone goes and modifies your javascript file and they write the same kind of uh, you know inject the same piece of code which is going to collect your uh, data and it's going to you know post it to some attackers bavs.com right so now what will happen is you will get a uh, policy violation from multiple users saying that hey now there is a new connect src violation to bavs.com and then you can be like hey what is this bavs.com you can do a quick uh, you know who is look up and then you will see that bavs.com is not really registered to you guys and then you can check with your developers and find out hey guys uh, bavs.com does not belong to us do you are you like you know uh, is it by design that you are communicating this web, with, with this website and if they say no then you have a problem on your hands right and it will get picked up in the first one hour or depending on how uh, how much traffic your website gets it will get picked up in the first few minutes of you know the attacker injecting his code and your develop and your users actually getting affected because you will start getting these uh, you know violation reports right so in the csp mode any egress traffic you will get a report and you know it will get picked up by your team okay so to get started you will need an initial policy and this can be a fairly decent initial policy which is for all of these uh, directives of interest uh, to monitor this attack we are setting it to self which means we are saying you can load these content from the same domain but not from a different domain right so this would mean that only the uh, content being loaded from external domains you will only get violations for those and you can go and update those in your policy right but this is a very good starting point you can just copy this policy of the slide and you can put it and you can get started right so there's not a whole lot of uh, customization you will have to do okay so this is how we can use csp to look for uh, your sites you know behavioral anomalies and you can detect those kind of data exfiltration attacks right so now uh, i've discussed the advantages at the very beginning itself of using the csp approach but there are some limitations to using csp for this purpose now the first thing is csp is not designed for uh, detecting data exfiltration attack csp's primary goal is to uh, you know prevent cross site scripting right so that's that's what it was designed for so what we are doing is we are using it for a purpose it was not originally designed for and all of you know how that how that works like when you take one system and you hack it to do something else yeah i mean it does do its work but then it it comes with its uh, little problems as well so the problems here are here are that it's possible to bypass this monitoring system and i have listed down a bunch of different bypasses i'll just cover them briefly so you can have a dns preface uh, based uh, you know prefetch based data leakage which is the attacker can say you know stolen data uh, dot attacker dot site and he can instead of putting it in a script tag or a, you know a style tag or whatever he can put it in a you know prefetch type of a tag now what will happen is the browser will make a dns uh, lookup to stolen data dot attacker dot site now if i am the owner of attacker dot site then this dns lookup will actually come to my dns server and if i just monitor all the incoming dns uh, lookups then i know the subdomain part is the attack is the you know like customers website uh, customers data 
for example if i'm uh, stealing credit card information now credit card information is like uh, what 20 digits so i can say credit card information dot attacker dot site right so when i since i own the dns server i can just look for all the subdomains which uh, you know came to me and they are all the credit card information right so this will not get picked up by csp you can uh, uh, you know navigate the user to your web website by doing something like this you can say location.href and you can set a new url the user will be redirected there and this will not get picked up by csp and or you can just put a href tag a link and you can maybe convince the user to click on it or you know even if by accident the user clicks on it you will get a uh, you know hit to your server that will not get picked up by csp i can do a window dot open which is i'll open a new pop up and that will not get picked up by csp so those are ways by which an attacker can actually perform an attack and your system monitoring system will not pick that up right but why should we still uh, look at csp as a valid approach uh, for this attack so the first thing is uh, yes it's not a perfect solution but it's better than having no solution right because it makes the attackers work harder they'll have to make uh, you know uh, uh, you know they'll have to put a little bit more effort in trying to bypass your system so usually you have this thing called uh, you know uh, 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 like, a, a, like a blind brute force type of attack where what the attackers will do is they will scan all the all they, they, let's say they find one specific uh, you know exploit okay they will scan all the servers on the internet to see which ones will you know uh, fit this particular exploit wherever this exploit works they will have another script which will go and inject their javascript everywhere right so in this case it's not a targeted attack they're just seeing whoever they have one technique they're just seeing where this technique will work and they just you know go and exploit that system so attacks like these are usually not customized with you know all these bypasses so your system will pick up things like this right most of the uh, common kind of attacks so that is one the second thing is csp is not a you know static standard it's a constantly evolving system right so they're adding new capabilities to csp which will uh, fix some of the bypasses that we just discussed about for example csp version 3 is adding two new directives called prefetch src and navigate to src which will block uh, like a bunch of uh, bypasses that we just spoke about so if you invest in csp right if you have a policy in place you have the process defined you have your team which is trained on it and you have this you know started this uh, you know discipline of looking at the alerts and so on so whenever csp is upgraded to the new system then automatically the bypasses also get fixed right so this is prefetch src so the, the the dns resolution will get taken care of here navigate to directive will take care of your uh, you know window dot location dot hdf window dot open as well as you know cl clicking the link kind of a uh, issue right so there is something else also you can do with csp which is you can uh, uh, use it to identify all the javascript code which is loaded on your uh, server uh, so the way you will do that is you will set your uh, script src to none okay uh, you can pick a time when your uh, you know site's traffic is low preferably you know later in the night or whenever you can you can set just script src alone to none and you can leave it on for like half an hour one hour whatever time and as your users are browsing your site <coughs> you will start getting csp violation reports now the csp violation report will have the list of the javascript file the, your site is trying to load right so from that you can create a list of all js files when i say js files these are not domain this is the exact this is the you know entire url of the js file which your site is loading so you can collect this list of js files which your site is loading you can keep it with you and you can run it again say after a week and then you can compare the list of javascript files and if you see some new js files being loaded then you can go and manually in investigate those js files and you can see if you know it looks okay or if it looks uh, malicious usually if the code is heavily obfuscated then that's clearly a sign of you know something uh, bad happening right so this is another thing you can do using csp which will also help you you know like address some of the loopholes we discussed earlier okay so with that we have covered the uh, you know entire approach there are a bunch of free tools available for you you have uh, uh, you can use them to generate your csp policies 
and uh, you have uh, open source uh, software available which you can use as the CSP reporting URI, right? So you can set it up on your server and it will process all your incoming uh, CSP violations and it will store it, uh, I think, in uh, Elasticsearch, right? Yeah. So that's the uh, that's the talk. I would uh, you know be happy to answer any questions you have on whatever we discussed. Yeah, CSP uh, policy is essentially a header. So I, it's a HTTP header. Yes. Uh, all the modern browsers support CSP header, right? But uh, the kind of directives that are supported, some browsers might support all the directives, some older ones might not support all the directives. But that does not really concern us. The reason is we are detect we are interested in detecting an attack, right? So uh, let's say Chrome. Chrome has like excellent support for CSP, right? Now Chrome, let's say Chrome makes up even worst case scenario, if even if it makes up 5% of your user base. Now if your site is compromised and if it is leaking data externally and uh, if your browser like 100 people use your site, so 5 of them are using Chrome, which means you are eventually going to get those CSP alerts to your server, right? So you as a monitoring person will get to know that, uh, hey, my site is talking to somebody it should not be talking to, right? So you don't have to get it from all of your users. If you, even if you get it from a small portion of your users, your objective is uh, met. So the browser support is not that big of a deal. But Chrome has really good browser support and Chrome has like excellent market share anyway. So I think we are uh, good that way. Yeah. So you had a question. Yeah, uh, so I just wanted to ask like, uh, do we configure CSP at the uh, web server level or at what po like at what point we configure the CSP these values and all? See that's entirely up to you. Uh, all the, the, the idea is to set the header. So you can decide as a person who owns the infrastructure where it's easier for you to do it. You can add a middleware or you can do it at the code level. You can do it at the web server level or if you have someone like uh, Cl Cloudflare for example, you can do it at that level. That's that's a internal operational decision for you to make, right? Wherever it's easier for you to uh, manage. Uh, and I had another question, just like a small one. So uh, previously you said we can tap into the native AT, uh, APIs of the J JavaScript, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, can those be used as a monitoring tool? Like uh, uh, every request it makes, uh, it just simply uh, like. Uh, creates a dump on a, some reporting server or something like that. Can it be used like, as a monitoring tool for all the requests in your website, something like that? Oh, you're saying uh, the uh, JavaScript approach. Right, yeah, the right. first one, yeah. If you go down that, of course you can do that. If, if you hook into the native API, of course you can collect all of that information. In fact, if you look at things like New Relic, New Relic APM for the, for the client side, that's what they do, right? But uh, would you want to do that is a big question because you would end up collecting a lot of data and you would be essentially, uh, you know, like leading to bandwidth consumption for your end user, right? Would you want to do all that? You will have if it's if that information is useful for you. Of course, you can, uh, you know, collect uh, like all the outbound network calls which is being made by your JavaScript. You can you can get a copy of all of that sent to your server. That's that's entirely technically it's possible. Thank you. Sure. Does this also collect the browser extensions uh, requests? That's a very good question. It will. Uh, it will collect uh, you know information from the browser extensions as well. But uh, you can filter them out from the policy details because you know when there is a violation which comes, it will tell you you know it will tell you which is the page on which it is happening and which is the violating uh, you know URL, right? So there you will know the extensions will have a separate URL and you can filter those things away. But it will get information from extensions also. However, you cannot. Uh, so the the things from extension is essentially noise. But if you try to, uh, you know, use that as a security uh, thing, which is to say, hey, I can use CSP to see if the user is to to protect the user from the extensions. That wouldn't work because the extension developer can just write one line of code which will just remove the CSP header itself, right? So he can bypass the CSP. So that approach will not work, right? Any other uh, questions? Sure. I think there's one more. So 
So how secure is this ESP? So if an attacker has the flexibility to inject some JavaScript code mm-hmm. or something like that, so wouldn't he be aware of uh, modifying the content security policy also? Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that depends. Uh, that's 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 uh, that's all I can say because it depends on where you are, you know, configuring the CSP policy and uh, how much control an attacker has. Like for example, if your server web server is compromised, but if you are adding the CSP header at the you know uh, Cloudflare level, still the attacker cannot do much. But there could be situations where an attacker has enough access to also override the CSP policy itself. At that point, you are just in bad luck, <laughs> right? 